There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and another episode of Zooming In where I engage with bookish social media luminaries the world over to talk about bookish literary writerly articles online. And welcome back to Roz of Scallydowning About the Books, joining us from merry old England. Hello, Roz. Hi, Hi Sean. It, 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 it may be merry here, but it's a bit chilly. I'm in my cozy, cozy winter jumper today. Well, it's cold here too, so there you go. This must be a British Empire thing. Um, we're here to talk. We're here to talk about uh, uh, really Marxist articles. Not a Marxist article, but a, a, a left-wing article called "What Was Literary Fiction" by Dan Sinikin, published in the Nation in early October. Roz and I have both read it, and I'm dying to hear Roz what you made of this. Well, I it was an appealing topic. This article because it's about literary fiction, or and implying uh, literary fiction is dead or disappearing. And I know you you and me, that's probably the kind of stuff we read most, isn't it? So the, Exclusively the whole... for yours truly, yes. <laughs> Exclusively for you and, and predominantly for me. So it was entertaining to, to read. The thing that I read most is apparently, you know, dead and disappearing. But actually, I mean, he had an interesting thesis uh, in the article, I thought, but I didn't entirely agree with it. So, yeah. What about you? Yeah, I would say the same. There was a lot of things in here that were new, new to me. And so it's kind of refined my perspective on how I might talk about literary fiction going <laughs> forward. Like he had some really nice expressions in lieu of, or like he said, when people ask him what he reads, he said, literary fiction. By that phrase, I mean fiction that privileges art over entertainment. Quite like that. Yes. There was a few yeah, others like, like that. I like that, although still very the subjective. two things. Well, exactly, and the two things aren't mutually exclusive, are they? You know, you can have aims of, of art, artistic quality and still be entertaining. Uh, but it's a fair description. It's almost sort of defined by default, isn't it? It's like things that are only trying to be entertaining and haven't got any wish to be. I don't know to to consider style and in a higher more literary sense they're not literary fiction as it's almost like it's a sort of a negative de definition isn't it because um, there's everything else isn't i'm not putting that very well am i well it, you're, it's 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 because it's almost impossible to really pin down and that's it's, maybe why i love it there was an article today in the guardian which kind of is a bit of a counterpart to um, the one we're talking about by um alex clark who's a sort of liter literary journalist and she said, okay, it's it's ultimately meaningless, except as a confused shorthand, literary fiction, for what's thought clever or ambitious or but beyond the comprehension of readers more suited to mass market or commercial fiction. So yes. she doesn't believe in using literary fiction as a as a label. I find it really, really useful though, don't you? And I do, and so, and and really, we, you and I have already started to talk about how subjective all this is, and that's ultimately my overarching conclusion. My literary fiction is somebody else's genre fiction or whatever, and that's fine. Indeed. But yeah, this article is very much about. It's almost like an economic analysis of yes. of yes. the publishing industry and how that has shaped what is labeled as literary fiction how the label emerged i did, i was surprised to find out it didn't we nobody used that phrase until about 1980 or something and yes, he, he said it was first really used in the late shocking. 70s and and then was significantly used from 1980 onwards which which was a surprise and yet okay it didn't surprise me in the end because i was thinking why do people want to need that as a label and it's because and he kind of says this is it, you know, it's because they wanted to distinguish between mass market, commercial, sort of popular genres and so on, and something else. So it's a publishing industry sort of driven term for the mar marketing. Mm -hmm. And you only need it at the point where the majority of people are reading the mass market or whatever. Let's think about the 19th century. 
you know, like Dickens didn't worry whether he was writing literary fiction or or if it because right. his books were incredibly popular yes. and they had huge commercial success. And, you know, he was just writing novels. Yeah. But if we read it now, we'd sort of say, oh, it's kind of literary fiction. But yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it's about the mass mass literacy and mass reading, isn't it? That that then it becomes a and there's been so much change since that term was yeah. first used in 1980 and, and and it was used by somebody who was kind of putting it in scare quotes to criticize the book of snobs among us it, so it was like almost me. used as a as a pejorative and then it entered kind of publishing vocabulary and it became a, a way of making literary fiction a genre like all the other genres but now and, it has absolutely no meaning from a publishing point of view because it, well, Amazon so puts puts Thirty Shades of Grey or whatever all that crap is in literary yeah. fiction category, and uh, the worst book ever written, uh, where, where the Crawdads Sing, is considered literary yeah. fiction. Oh, and so, uh, the Alchemist, Paul Coelho. The Alchemist, oh, yeah. God. <laughs> literary fiction. Oh. I suppose it, it it became useful at a point. Sort of more challenging uh, fiction was less marketable than it had been. I presume he's an academic, isn't he? Actually, in an English department, and I think like his interest actually is in the publishing industry, and you know he he's got a kind of like a, a line of thought that says you know as publishers have got bigger and you know more and more sort of publishing conglomerates that that's the the reason for creating this subcategory as it were but equally he's saying it, it it's now no longer it's become meaningless because as you say everything's thrown into it i'm not so sure but anyway <laughs> well, I, i'm not so sure either and so i think you and i keep coming back to our own subjective point of view which i think uh, it's not irrelevant to me, all this analysis from the publishing economic point of view. It does affect the books that are put in front of me when I wander into a bookstore mm. or, you know, when you look on BookTube and see what people are reading. But I'm free. And I feel like I'm not I'm yeah. easily I'm not easily swayed by all that marketing stuff. I don't care about it. And usually if something's a bestseller, that automatically means I'm not interested in reading it. So there's so yeah. I wanted to quote this it was a american judge trying to define what is obscenity and he oh. said his 1964 judge potter stewart it's a threshold test for obscenity he said i shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material i understand to be embraced within that description the uh, the term actually was hardcore pornography and perhaps mm -hmm. i could never succeed in intelligently be doing so but i know it when i see it and that's how I feel about literary fiction. I know it when I see it or when I read it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of the things that annoys me about it as a label, I suppose, is that it suggests that other kinds of genre fiction and literary fiction are in separate, you know, makes it puts things in very separate boxes. Um, and that's why I love it. Yeah. Yes. But, it, you know, there is a real crossover as well. I mean... Let's take the example of someone like Kazuo Ishiguro. Do you read his stuff at uh, all? Yeah, not, not not very happily. Not happily. But, you know, he, he'd probably get put in a literary fiction yes. kind of, you know, on, the, on those shelves in the shop. But Remains of the Day, that was historical fiction. Never Let Me Go was dystopian science fiction, sort of speculative yeah. fiction. And then it, one of his... A absolute favourite books of mine was relatively recent one, Buried Giant, and that was kind of like fantasy, but just on a, but written with that, our Dan, our Dan, our author would say, a way that privileged art over entertainment, but it, nevertheless, it it had sort of fantasy content. So, you know, and this is where I'm much more of a genre. I'm a genre policer, so I didn't like any of those books you just mentioned for the reasons yeah. that they let the genre crap bleed into them and, um, and ruin the books. So that's, so, yes, yeah. But... So I don't like any of the examples he gives about this merging, this blending of no. genre fiction tropes into literary fiction. Mm -hmm. I hate it. I despise it. I won't read it. What I, what makes me less interested in genre fiction that 
more limited examples, I suppose, of the genre is when they, there's like a set pattern. There's a set pattern to a fantasy novel or, or to a science or fiction. Template. You know, like a template. Yeah, exactly. Certain kind of elements, certain ways that the story is told or what, you know, it, it can be done well, but nevertheless, it follows that template. And I'm not really interested in reading books that are on a, a template, but I don't care. Hilary Mantel, I absolutely passionately enjoyed her series about Thomas oh Cromwell. It's absolutely historical fiction, but it's also 100% literary, you know. And, uh, and, and, and if I can just give my two cents worth on that, because I often use that as, a, as an example of, in my worldview, it is not historical fiction. Like historical fiction is a genre, and those yeah. kind of novels, they read like genre fiction. I recently read one that was about, I've forgotten her, forgotten her name now, set at the end of the Hundred Years' War. And the, it, was, it, mm -hmm. it was more like a genre novel and ultimately mm -hmm. unsatisfying to me in a way that Hilary Mantel, so I say, yeah, it's set back in history, but it's not historical fiction, it's literary fiction. So but, I but really that... do use that mm. as a way yeah. to distinguish. I'm a gatekeeper. Yeah. Yeah, you are a brutal gatekeeper. Would would Dan say that you've kind of fallen for the the publisher's marketing tool, and and that's constraining your no, choices? No, I think I think I'm far more. My brows far higher than any of that nonsense. I I just yeah. you know I have a very keenly attuned sense of what I like and what I don't like, and yeah. there was probably a few novels that. For example, some of the ones that I've loved from fr the furled middle brow imprint of Dean Street Press, mm -hmm. they were published as genre fiction or romance novels back in the day. Yeah. But because I like them, I deem them to be literary fiction. I get to decide for myself. Oh, I loved it. It must be literary fiction. <laughs> but they definitely work to a formula, the, the, the genre thing, isn't it? You know, is, yeah. is, there a, is there a formula? But I suppose you can you can follow more or less that formula and just you know play with it a bit, add more emphasis on I don't know exploring the human condition. That's I suppose something that I'd identify with with literary fiction rather than genre. And I try not to judge people that read that crap. But I don't usually succeed in not judging them. But they're judging me for not reading that crap. So it's, you know. There is something about things that follow a formula or a template that satisfies a need in... Um, in like sitcoms or on TV yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You kind of know where it's going to go. And you know, I know a lot of people who are very unhappy if a book doesn't have a sort of a fairly... A reasonably neat and complete yep. resolution. Tidy ending. Yep. Tidy ending. And, you know, it's obviously psychologically of value to those readers to know that that's what they're going to get. And, and I'm I, much more open to that kind of a story in TV form. I watch about two hours of TV a year, but when I do, those yeah. kind of stories are fine. Yeah. Yeah. And when I read a book that has kind of interesting themes and characters and a sort of you know, a, a non, a less linear plot and some sort of concern for the language used and so on. And then it has a neat resolution. I feel really cheated. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. It's like, yeah, it takes the, it takes the shine off the book for me. But you and I are readers who are prepared to share some of the work with the author, aren't we? And and right. And to me, that's almost how I define what I enjoy reading most of the time. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yes. yeah. It depends on how much of your mind you want to give to reading something. And, and I'm not going to criticize someone else for wanting, you know, to just relax. And I mean, I can read an Agatha, Agatha Christie with a mug of hot chocolate and a rug over my knees and be very happy. You know, why not? Sure. And there's there's a lot of literary fiction that's too highbrow for me where I would feel like I would have to do too much work or it just doesn't go here for me or it's the language is I feel locked out by by how highfalutin the the, the prose yeah. is or something so I'm kind of in the middle ground in that sense uh, you know I don't mm. want to go too highbrow like James Joyce Ulysses or something no no interest at all but not not genre fiction 
And I guess that's that's another place we differ because I'm happy to go there. Not all the time, you know, but I, I love an experimental book. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, you are I'm my game for that. And <laughs> my role model, I hope to get there when I'm your age. <laughs> but why should we, you know, as I say, the, all, everything is optional, isn't it? You know, and Absolutely. I wouldn't want to read that all the time. I'm very excited today because I saw, and this was a few days ago, but the Polari Prize, which is a prize in this in the UK for LGBTQ plus yeah. kind of literature, yeah. and uh, Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield um, won. won that. And I'm over the moon to see that book get a prize because, and that's the kind of experimental that, you know, is also very accessible. I haven't read it, but heard, heard really, really good things about it. I wanted to ask you, Roz, this was very much an American article by an American academic about the American publishing industry. Yes. Was there anything that didn't fit for you as a in terms of British publishing or? Anything? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, well, a, a couple of things didn't fit for me. And, and one is not about it being, in fact, possibly neither of them are, are, are about it, a UK perspective. I think there's two things. One is he really undervalues the successful contribution of independent publishers these days they struggle and as he you know as you say he's he's coming at it about you know the big forces of the market in in publishing and and it's hard work being an independent publisher but some of them are really flourishing at the moment i mean look at fitzcarraldo they've had two nobel prize winners in the last couple yeah, of years well, does and end by work. kind of holding those up as the place yeah. where literary fiction is still possible yeah. to be published. And I'm but, glad but, it at least ended that way. But where I disagree with him, I suppose, is because, like, if you, and I presume it's the same in America too, if you look back at the history of publishing in this country, it's not linear. It, it goes in waves. And those sort of, again and again, you get these sort of flurries of, of new publishers and independent publishers. And then, you know, maybe they get bought out by the big guys, but then you get more. He sort of seemed to see it as a very sort of clear cut pattern, whereas I think it's, I see waves. And, and that's very interesting because this is perhaps an excerpt from his new book, which has just been published. <sighs> it's called Big Fiction, How Conglomeration Changed the Publishing Industry and American Literature. Did this yeah. article make you interested in reading the full book or was this enough? I think for me, this was enough, but. Yeah, definitely, definitely enough. Because as I say, I think, you know, when someone's got a, a thesis and then they make everything fit and they have some things that really fit well, and then other things they kind of manipulate a bit to make fit i don't think that there was ever this age that he sort of describes when there was a really clear-cut separate set of books that were literary fiction you know i think there always has been that kind of crossover as i say i mean you know it, when virginia wolf came out with orlando nobody turned around and said you know oh look she's writing historical fiction writers always have used a whole variety of settings and ideas and i, I felt he just made it all too Clear cut. A little bit too pat. Too pat. We still managed yeah. to have a rousing discussion, nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. A final thought for me is you and I both really enjoy reading books in translation, don't we? And I wonder if there's an element that gives us permission to not think about what genre or category those books sit in because because they're in translation, they're from a different society or culture potentially it sort of opens the doors to being less blinkered or rigid in our because categories. i imagine that if genre fiction exists as a category whether it's publishing or whatever kind of category it would be in france or germany or russia or wherever mm -hmm. it would probably have quite a different meaning yeah, so i I'm always sure. just if it's translated i consider it literary fiction <laughs> Well, <laughs> I've never read a book that's in translation that, well, there was one that came out by a Russian, two Russian authors about six mm -hmm. years ago that sounded very genre-y. So I steer clear of that. But usually if it if it's translated into English, it's, it usually falls within literary fiction. 
although it, it may be about the shell, the shells, literal or metaphorical that you're looking at, because I think like maybe in in the world, you know, if you're a fantasy reader or a science fiction reader, there's probably sure, which I, I don't know anything about that exactly. You know, there, there, there will be some in translation that, you know, loads yes. probably, but we're just not not looking at them. Yeah, there's there's translated crap, too, in other words. Yeah, 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 but it's narrowed down, isn't it? Because so and such a small proportion of the book publishing market in the English speaking world is translation. So it, it it's been through. It's a bit like classics, actually. It's been through a winnowing process, hasn't it, yeah. to get translated in the same way that all the books that are still around have something going for them because again they've been through that sifting of time. I think mm. there's more for me to think about. Obviously, the, it, it, that's a sign of a of a good article, you know, interesting article, <laughs> pro- thought provoking article. That I, I have things to <laughs> think about. Like, does it make sense to even use the term literary fiction for something that was published before 1980? Not from a <laughs> marketing point of view, I guess it doesn't. But still, um, hmm, yeah, but, very interesting. But there was, if you, I mean, you know how I like to read Victorian fiction and you absolutely can find thought about Dickens and he was very popular but there's also like more kind of populist commercial fiction written then but it's just people just thought they were writing fiction so they didn't label yeah. it like that but it, it existed for sure so and if yeah. you look at Wilkie Collins novels a lot of them could easily be categorized as mysteries or whatever right absolutely absolutely yeah yeah but hey you and i can just go on reading the things that we like and we don't we don't have to apologize for using a handy label even if it's subjective and a bit you know was invented by some marketing publishing person you know it's if it's handy absolutely. use it <laughs> absolutely and i would only ever judge your reading choices if you veer too far into the into the hybrid genre literary <laughs> monstrosities <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh you're this a was so fu- I it's am fun. such a such <laughs> a snob. such a snob. This, yeah. this was such a such a fun chat ross thank you so much Yay.